like there was this uh, article i was reading on native trees mm. of delhi delhi has delhi has very beautiful native wow. vegetation it has really amazing forest ecosystem i was not expecting it also when i took up a project there i was constantly amazed and i fell in love with some of the plants it was just so fascinating uh, you don't so, get to see it in the city but the forest side of delhi still has amazing okay okay that, uh, i think we should we should uh, uh, yeah. discuss that more in details uh, uh, in the future uh, i was never not expecting that and i, I think a lot <laughs> of us don't uh, really realize like okay delhi has come so far as a city you know there are a lot of challenges but probably there yeah. was a lot of nature which still has its traces there and it's worth uh, discovering it and yeah. uh, maybe try to restore it a lot of us live in cities and are not so familiar with various trees around us and their origin at least this is quite true in my case if you can resonate with this and certainly this video is for you then the other one is use and value diversity very important again for human kind see such spiritual little principles yeah. we have here and it says don't put all your eggs in one basket which is very very true and uh, i'm going to read this text because it makes the most sense in the world uh, diversity reduces vulnerability to a variety of threats and takes advantage of the unique nature of environment in which it resides so um, we talk about monoculture mm -hmm. a lot right a uh, great example of no diversity so anything any sort of uh, any sort of invasion which happens on monocultures will be like you know in one go things are gone if if one plant catches a disease every plant will get that disease and off off we go so but what happens is also if you if you or let's say there's a pest problem mm -hmm. so if this certain kind of insect is feeding upon this certain kind of plant then that entire fig crop field is gone because that the insect family is coming and eating it all right but now if i have planted things in a way which is also companion planting a great example of use and value diversity uh companion planting where i'm mixing and matching or polyculture yeah. instead of monoculture then what happens if this pest this insect i'm not going to call it a pest let's just call it an insect i don't like these terminologies weeds and pests so if an insect is uh, eating from plant a then it needs to go to another plant a right but then surrounding it is no plant yeah. a there are different plant b plant c plant d plant d e f g h whatever and then <laughs> plant a is somewhere else so he would get lost like it would get that insect would get lost in trying to find its way to plant a so what it will do is it will feel full and leave so it would not da cause as much damage and even if it reaches plant a again your plant b d e f g h are safe still so you would still have the produce you know and that's something so important we don't really understand the the value of diversity if it was only i mean how beautiful we we talk of india as a country how beautiful it is that we have so many people practicing so many different yeah. beliefs and so many different cultures but do we really get to value the diversity no we just i don't know great then yeah. i don't really know why where in the world we are heading right I, now but uh, definitely need to use and yeah, value that i have one question harshita before we go to the next principle yeah. so when we say uh, yes. valuing the diversity of course um, uh, it makes sense to have the plants or uh, the whole ecosystem in place but over the period of time things do evolve uh, and of course evolution takes a lot of time mm -hmm. uh, but do you have any uh, examples or uh, uh, um, or maybe somewhere from the text or papers that you have read that certain ecosystem which was uh, mm. uh, definitely sort of a, a polyculture but not really uh, that diverse you know did it ever uh, mm. would it ever evolve to fit in so for example like uh, there are a bunch of crawling plants and uh, like fruit bearing mm. and uh, some some with the roots as well 
and lot of animals uh, under mm-hmm. the soil mm-hmm. uh, on the soil uh, water system everything mm-hmm. is in place but <clears throat> this is this is an ideal uh, situation but let's say uh, some plants which are uh, never to be together you know uh, and, yeah. and we try to bring them uh, in one place and no one has heard of it uh, I, i cannot really think of an example maybe you can point it out but it would be interesting like uh, does such mm-hmm. kind of evolution also happens in the space yes yes so when it uh, we need to understand one is natural progression of any place mm-hmm. any ecosystem and then the other is man introduced progression of uh, in any okay. ecosystem so when we talk about diversity see ecosystems are diverse of course when you are saying that uh, you know not if it's a fertile piece of land which you know nature has its own ways also like if you are in the mountains if you are in the plains which are karst plains you don't have like a lot of uh, soil to begin with right so you have rocks so you would have that special ecosystem so maybe not it won't be as diverse as something in the tropics right like amazon rainforest so there is uh, one thing which is uh, progression of any ecosystem evolution of any ecosystem which is in its own natural form and ways and then man introduced uh, evolution of any ecosystem so what happens there are a lot of places where you would have very interesting mm-hmm. ecosystems where you would not your bare eyes wouldn't see as much diversity but there also is a lot of yeah. diversity even there you know so like when we talk of aravalli hills mm-hmm. aravalli range it has it's divided in four different sec, uh, categories and uh, you know from river rivers uh, wait I, do i have it here i don't have it on my book i think oh no this is not the one so it has four different categories i wouldn't remember the names anymore right now but uh, you know certain plants would go in certain grow in certain places and some would uh, have this particular tree as the primary tree like and that's like the big forest of that tree and then supporting that tree some other shrubs or herbs or you know plants would be growing um so that happens but uh, when we introduce something see let's say talk about two plants which uh, which don't belong together but now have been introduced so what then happens is that we expose i am a great believer of i do it for myself i love collecting seeds wherever mm-hmm. i travel in the world however i do not advise others to do that till the time you really know what you are doing you should not because we don't understand the complications which come with us just bringing a seed or an alien plant to another piece of land we do not know how this plant would react with the current ecosystem will it become part of the ecosystem or will it take over hmm. that ecosystem so taking over that ecosystem we have lots like of coniferous forest lots of examples like coniferous forest Sorry? yeah and uh, like okay let's talk about do you know about no. lantana we can explain there is this mexican plant uh, it's a very beautiful beautiful shrub quite hardy you know it's quite medicinal pest repellent amazing but that somehow has traveled in so many different parts of the world i think it yeah it comes it's native to mexico if i'm not wrong yeah and now in india like here i was in dehradun some some weeks back and um i went to this waterfall which is a little outside the city and not 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 one of those places which tourists go to and i was just so sad because all i saw on the hills were were lantana surviving and thriving and great that they are there at least some form of some form of greenery is there but that is also mean that also means that the native vegetation is not there yeah. you know so so that happens with a lot of plants a lot cashew is a great example also of that so much of it has and how how, how is this boundary is made like you know because nature has always been evolving like you know birds bring the seeds or it it uh, comes through yeah. the wind storm could be many mediums you know also maybe the water but uh, is 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 there some kind of a list uh, that that we should really stick to or uh, let it let the nature take its course uh, because i mean right now i can understand maybe that was done by some human or maybe some birds uh, and i, I, mm. I i'm not sure if if we have an evidence for who did that uh, about the lantana but <laughs> yeah. humans humans for sure but yeah you know like uh, how how no, much uh, is can it be controlled because you know it it at some point it could you know just yeah. be anything 
so so that's again this is very important i think when british were ruling this country i mean since i work mostly in india i can like confidently speak of the facts uh, things which happened here so in delhi or in india prosopis juliflora is one of the one of the trees which is found mm-hmm. everywhere now and in delhi is like actually it has become invasive in aravalli itself it has become invasive with oh, the native fine. forest and it's a beautiful tree i love it i mean and it's uh, in i think and prosopis is also i think it's native to north america if i'm not wrong north of central america it's not something which grows here and like why on earth was it brought here it was brought here for some reason in 1930s and uh, now it has taken over so now like uh, the forest department which is now trying to plant uh, things in aravalli you know how do they do it they have to create a progression mechanism for that tree to die in order for other native plants to come back to life right mm. so there is a, there, there are things like this so i think as human beings we should not of course nature has always propagated seeds and it's great i that's why I, i love collecting seeds from different places but then also i have that sensibility okay if it is something which is growing so you know we we can always understand and see and study the ecosystems we are in so that's important you know and as long as i think also you can take the live, uh, privilege and luxury and liberty of sowing something from somewhere else let's say all the vegetables which we eat now the origin doesn't matter because i mean india never had yes, to yes true we don't yeah, i was going to come to that naturally right but now tomato, tomato. even the potatoes <laughs> Toma- tomato yeah potatoes i mean <laughs> so much of it like so now we live such a life of you know like where everything is so mixed up but let's say if if we are living in a in a city or if we are living on a peach patch of land which is far away from any forest i am okay i say it's okay if you want to introduce mm-hmm. certain things here it's okay you know if you are in that controlled environment where you can take care of it where it if it becomes invasive you are there to chop it down and control it then and there it's all right if you don't have that if you are one of my clients had her land in tamil nadu near mahabalipuram so which is the coastal town yeah. of tamil nadu right and uh, and uh, one of her boundaries was uh, like uh, one of her she was sharing one boundary with the forest reserve so then when we were designing the land i specifically told her i'm not going to provide you any non native species of plants to put there and and she really wanted for some reason because bougainvilleas are so beautiful mm. and she was like oh but i really want a bougainvillea and then i had to really like i told her no <laughs> no bougainvillea because we need to understand it will start thriving we have seen bougainvilleas thrive in in the area we are working with we know it will work but that also means that less and less native plants will grow because this will be fast yeah. right so if you are touching forest boundaries anywhere closer to a forest do not plant non native stuff if you are able to you know in a very small area manage it on your own do it but don't do it like a lot of landscaping trees it has happened worldwide it has happened if you go to brazil or if you're in india it's shocking that the same trees are used for landscaping here and there okay some some would argue that the 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 climate is similar but but things which come from there do not belong here we need to understand trees from australia you know are just grown here lucina is one of the fastest growing trees it's a nitrogen fix a great tree highly invasive in india highly invasive it takes over the the saplings the the germination rate is high even though when i was working with them some years back we struggled with germination so we had to do stem propagation it was for some cows we were preparing some patch of land which then they they like eating lucina uh, so it was a very small patch of land anyways luckily none of it survived because they destroyed it all <laughs> <laughs> back then also i was not so aware of their invasive properties so i also did it like everybody else yeah. does that let's just plant it because it grows faster you know like how the government thought okay let's put lucinas on the sides of the road because they grow fast but then the lucina is has overtaken like the entire forest because you have lucina babies sure. sprouting everywhere and then what do you do you have to literally weed them out there's no other way how many labors are you going to hire or how much of your time and effort you're going to put in weeding it out well wow, that's that's so, a lot of details i think i i yeah so i think if we can really understand no i'm saying like uh, that's a lot of details uh, which uh, 
a lot of us don't know. Uh, I personally myself was never thinking uh, it uh, in that way. I was also seeing the constructive part of it, you know, uh, when we talk about diversity, mm-hmm. okay, uh, anything can come together and fall in place. Uh, there might be a few exceptions, but this is like uh, an only example that I was thinking in a, in a, on the negative side was maybe sometimes coniferous forest because I spoke with someone about it and that was the perspective. But there are so many details, so many layers, you know, one uh, starts looking around, uh, you'll find it. Uh, and unless you are aware, it could go either ways, right? Yeah. And, See, I think, I think, I mean, just to add a little bit of context to what you said, I think it's great mm-hmm. to mix and match. Personally, I like <clears throat> to do it. But when I'm in, in this position of talking and others can probably listen to it and feel it's okay to do it, that's where the problem begins. If you know how to do certain things, it's okay. But like in Oroville, which is home for me, uh, when we... You know, it was so deserted that none of the native species could grow. Then they introduced some plants from Australia, the acacias from Australia, because they could grow in any kind of soil. They could grow in hard, rocky patches. So they became the pioneer trees for rest of the trees to grow. Of course, like the, a little bit of mess up happened there also. But then the they had chosen silver acacia. It grows some two to three meters tall and has a lifespan of five to seven eight years so it dies and if any plant takes over and becomes higher like and it needs a lot of sun so what would happen is that if if the tree wouldn't get if the shrub wouldn't get enough sun then it would just die so that was very interesting that they used something which was foreign for in order to build the soil and it was so see again with a little bit of perspective how things were changed there right so but but that's not the truth of the entirety you know eucalyptus forests if you go to Kodai Canal you have tons of eucalyptus forests but then no and people go there and they're so fascinated because you have such fragrant yeah. eucalypt forest what we don't understand that that uh, to have that eucalypt forest you had to like the for the eucalyptus took over shola sholai trees the native uh, trees which belong to that very plain so that very mountainous region so so these are the things important but of course I think if you know how to do the permutation and combination great go ahead is there already some references which one can follow to you know make some kind of segregation or at least uh, basic building blocks mm-hmm. uh, to have you know this understanding of which seeds can fit in and which cannot see i think what is the most important to understand is when when specifically we are working with land mm-hmm. in specific huh then I imagine you have some sort of a passion or interest towards towards maintaining the life of land. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. So, you know, people who are working, living in cities and living their life, they're growing some of their zucchinis and their planters. It's fine. They, they, they're not, uh, we don't need to worry about that. But when we have a patch of land and we want to do it, it becomes our moral, ethical responsibility, absolute responsibility to educate ourselves on what grows mm. naturally. If you don't know, don't do it. Take classes, meet people, find books. We live in the world where we are sure. so full of books. There are so many books, amazing books. You know, scientists, researchers, ecologists have spent their lives in certain areas and they've written specifically, exclusively, explicitly about those yeah. areas. Read it up. Understand. Go for forest walks. Go for nature walks. See what is native. Question. Find people who have the, find the locals which know what and what not spend time with them that's the only way if you don't do it then it's half-baked knowledge with you which you carry and then you are again a danger yeah. to the plant world that's no it, it, it absolutely makes sense because this, this has to be made very clear also uh, i mean uh, because a lot of us are very detached you know living in the cities and uh, away from mm. the I mean, we do visit nature from time to time, but having that knowledge, I think what you mentioned, uh, learn from the locals. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very, very uh, interesting and uh, and the most practical thing to do because they just know generation by generation. Yeah. Uh, at least I can relate to that in India, uh, where uh, mm-hmm. in a lot of uh, tribes or villages, they just know it just by heart. You know, uh, the kids, uh, you would say like, okay, they are not going to school. Uh, that's a different subject, uh, but they are very literate 
in uh, in the nature in the knowledge of nature and how things work and uh, which things don't work you know what's a mismatch and it just comes organically to them and uh, mm. i think that's one great source but uh, if you talk about books uh, do you have like already some references uh, if you don't remember it i can also mention it later uh, around this subject that we were discussing yeah with books uh, with books when we talk about native species specifically you know and we are talking so you have lots of books like uh, again the, the, the books which i would know or which i read are if i will if i'm doing a project let's say in the place i am at mm. i will read the book of native plants here i will go for uh, forest walks i would meet up the local villages so it's it's the same thing for me as anybody else you know when i was doing a project in delhi in aravalli i had never worked in aravalli range before so then i was reading the native uh, then i was referencing with two books one uh, was by pradeep krishnan and the other book was uh, with some body of work in government but they had done good work like they had made a very thick book and and those were my reference books that i would read uh, them and then i would go and you know and then you become curious even if you're traveling by metro or if you're taking a bus or if you're taking a taxi and then you look around and then you go like oh okay this one is this plant and then you cross check so i think that's what i also do so one book i wouldn't be able to per se tell you because it's very specific that's fine when we talk about the plant world it's really specific right but uh, yeah where you are at like every 10 kilometers the ecology is changing so it's just like it's so specific you will have to uh, find it wherever you know let's say when i was working in goa so goa has such rich flora and fauna so then there are tons of books which then you research from when you're working there so Uh, yeah it's not one source but it's always you can always find something even if you look in the, on the internet you'll find a lot of free books also to download so it's good to start with but then don't only uh, my only suggestion would be don't only focus on one yeah. book which you buy or which you are sourcing or referencing because a lot of times especially when it's the free material available on internet what happens is you have a lot of uh, miscommun misinformation pr- present also there like there was this uh, article i was reading on native trees mm. of delhi and then it included at this moment if you plant. say the native vegetation yeah, what, what of delhi I, I, i mean my my bl- mind will just go blank no, but uh, no. it's it's worth mentioning it you know because we have come so far delhi has delhi has very beautiful native wow. vegetation it has really amazing forest ecosystem i was not expecting it also when i took up a project there i was constantly amazed and i fell in love with some of the plants it was just so fascinating you don't True. get to see it in the city but the forest side of delhi still has amazing okay plants. okay that, uh, i think we should we should uh, uh, yeah. discuss that more in details uh, uh, in the future uh, i was never not expecting that and i, I think a lot <laughs> of us don't uh, really realize like okay delhi has come so far as a city you know there are a lot of challenges but probably there yeah. was a, a lot of nature which still has its traces there and it's worth uh, discovering it and yeah. uh, maybe try to restore it uh, i'm not sure if the projects are probably already going right for the restoration yeah a lot of lot of i think restoration projects and people who are doing restoration around delhi and in delhi uh, some of them who i know they are like really mm. good ecologists working so it's something which gives you a little bit of breather that okay something good's happening there one of the one of the nurseries like one of the wildlife sanctuaries they have uh, successfully managed to have i think 80 to 100 different species wow. of forest plants and they're <clears> growing it because i amazing they have like humongous nursery and all you get is native plants of course some non native also because you know sometimes that's also required and uh, some some flowering plants or <laughs> g20 was happening at that time so they were uh, preparing a lot of pots for the government but which were all non native species like you call all the delegates to to india and then <laughs> then for this play you have all these exotic plants from all across the world but not indian plants so uh, use edges and value the marginal this is a very interesting also one of the principles i deeply love So would you like to add some example and and the quotation which goes with it is don't think I am yeah. going to talk about it yes because it's a little bit of a ha huh, abstraction right now when i say use edges and value the margin and so we'll get into it don't think you are on a right track just because it's a well beaten path hmm. says a lot <laughs> so uh, yeah i'll read a little bit about it and then we can we can talk about some examples so the interface between things 
is where the most interesting events take place. These are often the most valuable, diverse and productive elements in the ecosystem. So use edges and value the marginal. Now what's happening is it's talking about an interface between two things, right? So if we have to talk about the examples, edges are very important. Anywhere, edges are very important. So if if your if your farm is meeting a road, that edge will have a different ecosystem than the farm and the ecosystem yeah. on the road, right? <clears throat> it's a mixture. It's, it's where two ecosystems are merging. If a pond or a water body is meeting where the water body is meeting the land is where you will have the most diverse ecosystem. Right. Right. So uh, when where Western Ghats meet the ocean is the most diverse ecosystem. You would have things endemic to that ecosystem. So, so that's what it means that where two ecosystems are meeting, those edges are important. Um, so let's say if there's a pond and you would see also around the pond, the plants which grow and the kind of insects and the kind of uh, wildlife it attracts it's like very yeah. fascinating right you will have pond will have its pond will have its own ecosystem forest will have its own ecosystem but that area where they both merge where they both meet is where you will have the most interesting vegetation also where you'll have interesting turn of events so that's what it says edges are very very crucial yeah in a small piece of land let's say when we think of permaculture i mean at least it, i say it for myself uh acres or whatever mm. but then there are like bigger geographical boundaries uh with different elements in it uh be yeah. it river mountain or plains you know uh, and those boundaries and i think they are they are well, yeah. that's that's a completely different way of looking at it i think yeah yeah now it's so i mean also it's just so so beautiful and so fascinating the more you dive into it the more you're amazed where two ecosystems meet it's like amazing you just see amazing like it's just i don't know i i've become so happy talking about it because it's just like uh, this very 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 interesting thing to witness also uh edges is, has great great thing in permaculture like we talk a lot about edges use edges we try to extend the edges we try to expand on the edges so that's why if you will see a permaculture farm even in design or if you would see a drone shot of any permaculture farm you would not find a lot of straight mm. lines you would find a lot of curves and you would find a lot of edges you would find a lot of patterns which are very asymmetrical and why because you if 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 i'm farming in a straight line versus if i make a curve if i'm making if i increase the area of my edges i will end up producing more so it's never linear yeah. that way it's never straight it's always with edges so the more you will the more edges you create the more diverse you make the, make an ecosystem to be in the forest you don't have yeah straight straight yeah. straight 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 it's it's always the curve so that's what it's always the river flow it's always that flow so the more the more anything flows the the better the better area we get to use also for our own selfish wow. purposes and is there is there um, a reason for so, that so i was just thinking like if i have to question like okay uh, that's how the forests are they just uh, find their make their ways even the rivers you know uh, over the period of time they they mm -hmm. they make their course um but in permaculture, when you're designing a farm, um, uh, so maybe the boundaries are going to restrict the roots or like, w what is the explanation for this? I was. Hmm. Hmm. So one thing we need to talk about when we're talking about this is in specification to any land patch, which we as humans have a boundary to is of contours. Okay. So contour lines, 